the service this evening. The word of God says that the Lord's name is to be praised from the rising of the sun to, to the going down of the sun. We have come to praise him to its going down. Does anyone have a favorite that we have? Speaking voice and through your word, 
Lord, we do pray that you would give us hearts that are open and receptive, teachable, Lord, as we hear your word this evening. Lord, help us, we pray, to be those who do truly humble themselves Amen. and seek after thy face, yeah. and to be those who repent and turn from our wicked ways. Oh, Lord, that we would hear of heaven and heaven. Yeah. Lord, we would see your hand mightily at work. And even as we have sung, we know that we can never repay the debt of love we have. And yet it is our prayer, Lord, that we will be found a faithful part of your work. Lord, we give a grateful thanks that our Saviour in heaven remembers us this day and even intercedes for us. And we know it is not because of our faithfulness, although we pray that we would be more faithful. He remembers us even as he sits in glory because of his faithfulness to his people. Oh Lord, what a gracious God in heaven we see. What a comfort it is to our hearts to remember this day. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we gather in worship tonight. May we enter into true and believing worship that glorifies our Savior and that edifies in your sins. We ask in Jesus' name. Please return with me to the Psalm 1. It's right at the beginning of the Hymn of page 5. And we stand together as we sing the Psalm.
Father, Lord, we give thee thanks that already our hearts and minds have been drawn to Calvary. We recognize that it is on the basis of Christ's work of the cross that we approach thee in prayer. Even as we have sang of the blessed man, we thank thee for the man who is blessed above all others. We thank thee that there was a man holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners. While we cannot approach on our own merit, we come to thee this evening on all the merit of thy dear Son. We thank thee for the access that we have in him. O oh Lord, we look to thee that during this season of worship this evening that you'll be pleased to come and to minister Christ afresh to us. O oh Lord, we recognize that we are surrounded by the wicked men whose way will ultimately be overthrown. We need grace to live as righteous men and women and young people as children in this ungodly age. Our help is not found in the world in the media but our help comes from the Lord and tonight we pray then that we will know that fresh help we pray that during this season this evening that you will be pleased to come near oh Lord I pray that truly we will know a gracious sense of the Lord's presence in this time of worship. O oh Lord, we pray that heaven is where we'll come down, and that this time will be a time of revival and blessing. O oh Lord, we need to remember those that are unable to be among us, especially those that are sick. We pray, dear Lord, that you be pleased to touch them. Raise them up to a good measure of health and strength again. O oh Lord, we do look to thee for the congregation as a whole, that we will know the Lord's blessing and reviving as we enter into a new year of labor in the Lord's name. Despite all of the uncertainties before us, we pray that it will be a year that is marked out by rich blessing. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that as the work among the children and young people recommences in coming weeks, as the outreach in Wandana recommences and other outreaches, we pray, O oh Lord, that we will know times of rich blessing. Lord, the Spirit of God will indeed come down. O Lord, we cry to thee for the salvation of precious souls. We pray for the reaching of the lost in this neighborhood and throughout this city. O Lord, we pray that a great work will be done for our Lord's honor and glory. So, Lord, we commend this season to thee. Please to come and to minister to us in the Lord's word. Amen. Before we have our next um, hymn, we're going to have the catechism. Uh, so the words be on the screen here. It's the larger catechism, question 49. And we've been looking then about the Lord's humiliation. Last time, the Lord's humiliation in his life. Uh, remember, really, we're focusing in these questions on those words in Philippians, where the Lord had these steps down, 
and wherefore God hath highly exalted him. And so we're, we're dealing with the Lord's humiliation. How did Christ humble himself in his death? Christ humbled himself in his death, in that having been betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples, scorned and rejected by the world, condemned by Pilate, and tormented by his persecutors, having also conflicted with the terrors of death and the powers of darkness, felt and bore the weight of God's wrath, he laid down his life an offering for sin, enduring the painful, shameful, and cursed death of the cross. And so there was that humiliation that our Lord endured, and really the answer here is covering the whole passion as we often refer to it as. So the uh, betrayal, the season in the garden, the disciples forsaking the Lord, uh, the Lord's trial uh, before the, the Jewish hierarchy, and then Pilate, the various sufferings associated with the, the cross. And this was all uh, part of our Lord's humiliation. And it begins with reference to Judas. And we think of that one that had walked with the Lord, that had witnessed the Lord's miracles. And yet he betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And surely that was part of our Lord's humiliation. Not one of the enemies betraying him, the one that had been called his friend. The disciples forsaking him, whether out of fear or out of disappointment, they forsook him. Our Lord was left alone. Scorned and rejected by the world. We think of how, as our Saviour was being tried and then beaten by the Romans, the crucifixion itself, and all of the mockery at the cross. We think of him as the great creator, the Lord of all the Lord, yet despised and spat upon. Then to endure the powers of darkness, as all hell as it were, was launched against our Saviour, right to the cruel death of the, the cross itself. But the crucifixion was a cruel death. Remember, it talks about not a bone of our Lord's body being broken, which was portrayed in the Passover lamb. So in the crucifixion, no vital organ of the body was directly injured. But that added to the, the prolonged agony, usually to the point of suffocation, exhaustion, extreme thirst. Our Lord, of course, he died sooner than the thieves. Remember how their legs were broken in order to speed up their death because the Sabbath was approaching, but our Lord's death was in the end voluntary, and that he dismissed his first. He yielded up the ghost. He died in crucifixion, but not of it. He said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. And that event of the cross is, of course, the focal point of Scripture. It's the focal point of world history. It's our hope that Christ will die for us. As we think of all the agonies that our Lord endured, was for us to be found. Praise God today. He has risen. He endured that hateful, shameful, and cursed death of the cross. Remember those words, first of the sea, the night of the tree. But today he is exalted on the Father's right hand. We'll have a word of prayer together. Our gracious Father, how we give thee thanks for the cross. 
Thank thee for all that our Saviour endured there in our behalf. We pray, Lord, that this message of Calvary will thrill our hearts today and every day. Thank thee that through eternity we shall never tire of it. Through all eternity we will sing the word of peace. Continue with us in our worship, we pray in the Lord's name. Our brother Babs is going to come and lead us in the next. Seven six hundred and forty-four on page four three six. We stand together again and sing this. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Stand. from 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, and then also some words in chapter 7. I've been trying to read different parts of this particular passage over the last few weeks. We're going to read the first part of chapter 6 this evening. So 2 Chronicles chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 1. Remember, this is the, the day of the great dedication, the great dedication day of the temple. Then said Solomon, the Lord had said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. But I have built a house of habitation for thee, and a place for thy dwelling forever. The king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. He said... Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people 
out of the land of Egypt. I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there. And have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And I was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thine heart to build a house for my name, thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build a house, but thy son, which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build a house for my name. The Lord therefore hath performed his word that he had spoken. For I am risen up in the room of David my father, and am set on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. In it have I put the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the children of Israel. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel, and spread forth his hands, for Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, and five cubits broad, and three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court. Upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keep his covenant and show his mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. And so we have the great prayer of Solomon. And in chapter 7 then, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12, some days later, chapter 7, verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And then there, the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Before Brother Bevis comes and leads us in our offering head, could I welcome you all to the service this evening? It's good to see each one of you gathered with us. And trust that the Lord will draw near and minister to our hearts to come very soon to consider uh, again our model text for 2022. There'll be no men's prayer meeting tomorrow night. I'll be off on leave for the next fortnight, so no men's prayer meeting tomorrow. Or next Monday, uh, the Wednesday meeting, Wednesday night meeting will be on as usual. And so on Wednesday evening, there will be a presentation concerning the work of our sister Joanne Greer in Liberia. And uh, do come along and hear concerning the work of our sister on Wednesday night at 7. The service is next Lord's Day at the usual time, so Brother Bevis will be ministering next Lord's Day. And uh, since uh, the prayer meeting will fall on Australia Day, or the normal night we have the prayer meeting the following week, it won't be then on the Wednesday. Uh, so no prayer meeting on the 26th, it will be on the 27th instead. So not on Australia Day, but the following evening, Thursday, the 27th. On the Lord's Day, the 30th, my brother Pastor Alan Beardmore from Shenton Park uh, will be along to share God's work with us. We certainly appreciated the ministry of God's servant in the past and we look forward to him coming and joining with us for that, especially on the Lord's Day, the 30th, in the evening time. I think these are all the necessary announcements just to remind you of that day of prayer and fasting that we'll have, God willing, 
right, in chapter 13 through 229, we pray about the this season of great rest. Uh, for those that are joining us on the uh, webcast, we welcome you in our Lord's name. Thank you for joining us on this time of worship. Put up my friend from the world, chapter 482, on page 370, as I am waiting for the next sequence of the offering. Chronicles 7 verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly in prayer. Let's ask that the Lord will be pleased to come and minister to our hearts. Our gracious Father, we ask, dear Lord, that in this season that we will hear the Lord's voice. O oh Lord, we pray that 
The scriptures that are before us will be taken again. Laid upon our hearts, we thank thee that you have been searching our hearts in recent meetings, and we cry to thee that we will again hear that voice of the Lord ministering to us. Grant that needed help. We pray in the Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. On the first Lord's Day of this year, Brother Bevis was telling us about the value of resolutions and he talked about the resolutions of that great preacher Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards started writing those resolutions when he was 18. Some of them he wrote when he was 19. Some of them he wrote when he was 20. And I was struck by one of those resolutions in the past week and it has a bearing on the subject that I want us to look at this evening. His 65th resolution was resolved very much to exercise myself in this all my life long, that is with the greatest openness of which I am capable of, to declare my ways to God, to lay open my soul to Him, to lay open all my sins, all my temptations, all my difficulties, all my sorrows, all my fears, hopes, desires, and everything. And every circumstance, according to Dr. Mountain's 27th sermon on Psalm 119. And so the resolution shows us that Jonathan Edwards, in his youth, was reading the very best of material. He was reading the sermons of Thomas Manton on Psalm 119. Remember, that's the largest chapter that we have in the Bible. And Manton preached 190 sermons on that particular psalm. And some months back, someone made the comment that the only sermons they'd ever heard in this church were from the book of Genesis. Well, I think people going to hear Manton might have thought the only sermons I'm hearing is from Psalm 190. And evidently, Jonathan Edwards was struck by one of those sermons in particular. The 27th, it was based on words of Psalm 119, 26, where the psalmist says, I have declared my ways. And in that sermon, Manton is talking about the subject of transparency. Transparency. That is, he's talking about David's open and free dealing with God. That is, we are to be transparent. And of course, the foolish thing to be anything else before the Lord, and yet so often we are something else. We're to be transparent before the Lord. And so he said, they, that's God's people, should learn to lay open their whole case to him, to declare what they are about, the state of their hearts, what good or evil they find in themselves. Now how does this relate to the words that are before us? Well this evening I want us to focus on these words, turn from their wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways. If we are going to turn from our wicked ways, then first we must identify that there are those wicked ways. If we're going to repent from our sin, then we need to recognize that there is a sinful path in which we are walking. As we come to these words, turn from their wicked ways, we might think, yes, these words are definitely very important, and they're words that our country should consider. Well, that's true. Our nation should turn from the wicked ways of abortion. And that is true. Our nation should turn from sexual sin in all of its shades. And that is true. Our nation should turn from corruption. And that is true. And there is then a sense in which we could look at this text, this part of the text, evangelistically. The Lord does say to the ungodly, 
turn from your wicked ways. Remember those in the city of Nineveh when they heard the preaching of Jonah? Jonah 3.10, they turned from their wicked, from their evil way, from their wicked way. Isaiah 55 verse 7, and that chapter is certainly evangelistic. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return, or let him turn unto the Lord. Let him forsake his sin, let him turn to the Lord. And there is that great promise, the Lord will abundantly pardon. Ezekiel 33, 11, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and live. Then there comes that great command, turn ye. And so this is God's command to the ungodly today. Turn from your, your wicked way. And yet remember, this text of scripture is addressed to the Lord's people. And my people, which are called by my name. And so, as we look at these words, it's speaking to those that are already called of the Lord. Those that are converted, the Lord says to his people, turn from your wicked ways. And notice that when we go on in the text, it says that if we do so, the Lord will forgive their sin. And so it's sin in the life of the Lord's people that this text is dealing with. And therefore, these are words that have an application to every believer. And so our response is not to be, that's a good text for that Christian on the other side of the meeting. It may well be, but it's a good text for every one of our hearts. We all have to respond. I say that because this word that's translated wicked is much broader in its meaning than we might expect. So we might look at that word wicked and we say, well, I don't have wicked ways. That word wicked embraces that which is displeasing. Please, you think of it in that way. Turn from your displeasing ways. Is there a believer in this meeting that can honestly say before God, there is nothing in my life that is displeasing to the Lord? If we're honest at all, if we know anything about our hearts, we must resolve the bad words. Keep those open accounts. For in all of our lives, every day, there are those things that are displeasing. Therefore, we sang earlier, Search me, O God. Know my heart today. It's based on Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. See if there be any wicked way in. And it's not meaning, the psalmist is not meaning. Look and try and find if there's any way. The psalmist knows it. Is. But it has the idea, see it and show it to me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Surely then, this turning from our wicked ways, turning from those things that are displeasing to the Lord, it's talking about repentance. Repentance in the life of the Christian. So repentance is not just something for the sinner, and it's certainly something for the unconverted. They must repent. Yet every one of us we must repent, turn from our wicked ways. I want to see first of all that this repentance is associated with sanctification. Sanctification. Remember that word sanctification. It refers to holiness of life. It has to do with our growth 
in grace. And so if you're a believer, the moment you believed, you were justified. Completely, fully accepted before God. But there is to be this process of being more Christ-like. So justification is an act, but this sanctification is a process. It's something that's gradual. We are to turn from these things that are displeasing. And there's a gradual aspect to it. The more we go on with God, the more we should see that there are things that we are to turn from. And so maybe when we first come to the Lord, there are those things that we can evidently see, these are things that I must turn away from. Thinking back to what we talked with the children about this morning, our minds need to change. And there should be an instant transformation. That's not complete, of course. There should be an instant transformation. But then the more we go on with the Lord, there are other things that we have never realized are sinful that we discover they are. We are, we are to hate them more and more and turn from them. And so this repentance is associated with our sanctification, this growth that there is to be in the life of the Christian. And so this verse does certainly have a very obvious application to Christians that have fallen into gross and grievous sin. So for the believer who has fallen back into drunkenness or some sort of immorality or into drug abuse or into idolatry or heresy, there is to be repentance. There is to be abandonment. Such sins are serious. They must be repented of. If you could look with me in Second Thessalonians, please. Second Thessalonians and the chapter 3. Second Thessalonians 3 and the verse 6. Second Thessalonians 3 and the verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And not after the tradition which he received of us. And here Paul evidently is talking about something that's very serious. There are people that profess the name of the Lord. And until they repent, the Lord's people are to withdraw from them. Withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. These people are to see that their walk is disorderly completely contrary to their testimony and therefore until there's repentance we can't even recognize them as brothers and sisters in the Lord. There has to be that turning. That phrase that we have in the authorized version walketh disorderly and it's a Greek word that has the idea of unruly. Those that are walking in an unruly way. It's actually a word that comes from the military. It has the idea of one that has been appointed as a soldier but he is out of rank. Out of rank. It has the idea he is not living according to the rules. So very literally the words actually mean not ordained. The word means not ordained not described. He's walking in a way not ordained with the Lord. He's walking in a way not prescribed by the Lord. And this verse then surely wouldn't fit very well with those people that we call antinomians. That is, those that say that the law has nothing to do with the Christian. No law. Once you're saved, doesn't really matter how you live. That's not what Paul says here. Paul says there is a way the Lord is prescribed. 
There's a person that names the name of Christ and he ignores the way that the Lord has described this very serious matter. Sin is not to be viewed lightly. If we're not to take 2 Chronicles 7.14 and say, it's just for that group of people. Just for those we might call unruly. As I've said, we're all to repent. We're all to live in a state of penitence. Because we all have sinned to repent of. Of course, that, sin, that, that list of sins is so long. There's so many things that displease the Lord. So many things in the lives of God's people today that displease the Lord. Hebrews 12, 15 talks about the root of bitterness. We very often tolerate that sin, don't we? It might be as one writer described a respectable sin. Now, the writer wasn't saying that there actually are respectable sins, but he's saying that the way we deal with them sometimes gives that impression. Not as bad as others. God is displeased with bitterness. Similarly, his refusal to forgive. Remember, Peter asked that question, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. If he's offended me all these times and I have forgiven, do I have to keep on forgiving? Paul talked about that in Colossians 3 13. He said there's to be a forbearing of one another, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Resentment comes into our hearts, doesn't it? That unforgiving spirit is displeasing to the Lord. Peter talked in 1 Peter 2, verse 1, about laying aside all malice. Is that another one of those sins we tolerate? Laying aside all guile, deceitfulness, plotting, laying aside hypocrisies. There's more of the Pharisees in us than we care to admit, where we say, This is how you must live, but it's not necessarily the way I live. Lay aside envies, lay aside evil speaking. Or there's the sin of laziness, and the other extreme, the sin of being engrossed in work to neglect of that which is of greater importance. We put up with those sins, don't we? Surely our text is saying there's to be a striving after sinlessness. Now, this side of eternity, we will not achieve sinlessness. The closer we get to the Lord, the more we realize that we won't achieve this side of eternity. And yet, it is to be our desire. Robert Murray McShane was his great desire to live a life of holiness. He believed that Christian effectiveness is largely dependent upon, of course, under God, but largely dependent upon. Healing Christ likeness. So it was his desire that he live as possible for a deep sinner to attain to in this world. And it said then that he prayed, Dear Lord, make me as holy as it's possible for a hardened sinner to be. Is that our prayer tonight? Make me as holy as it's possible for. I would take the soul to be. Remember how Owen talked about be killing sin. Or it will be killing you. 
this duty to mortify, as Owen was talking about, taking that word from scripture, we're to be slaves in, putting it to death, taking the sword to it, turning from our wicked way, turning from that which is displeasing, and delighting then in that which is pleasing unto the Lord. And surely, we are to remind ourselves then that the Christian is to be fighting from victory to victory. Christ is the great victor over sin and the cross. And this is our starting point. That we seek to know victory through that great victory of Christ. Our cause is not a lost one. The Lord challenged Solomon here that the nation would turn from its wicked ways. It was not a lost cause. And it's not a lost cause for, for you and I. We're enabled to turn through the glorious victory of Christ. So this repentance is associated with sanctification. I want to see then, secondly, that this turning is associated with heeding <coughs> discipline. Associated with heeding discipline. And this word wicked, as it's translated in our authorized version, is a very interesting word. For it's used in a number of different ways in Scripture. And this word is used in the Old Testament to describe calamity. So in the Old Testament, when we read of what we might call today natural disasters and Strictly speaking, of course, they're not natural disasters, but what we might call natural disasters, the Bible calls them wicked. It's this Hebrew word that is used. So it talks of adversity, calamity. Now, at first, that might seem an odd thing to us, because we think of wickedness in terms of morality. And so... What does adversity, what does calamity have to do with morality? But even in English, we sometimes do talk about a good and a bad day. If we say it's been a bad day, we're not talking in the sense of morality. And so here in Hebrew, evil is not always related to morality. So for example, Amos 3 verse 6, Shall there be evil in a city? And the Lord hath not done it. It is talking about calamity. Isaiah 45 verse 7. I make peace and create evil. And the Lord is not saying, I am the cause of sin. Because of course he is not. God does not create sin. But God does bring about calamity through his providence. Job 2.10, shall we not, shall we receive good in the hand of the Lord, and shall we not receive evil? In the Lord's problems, there are those times of great trouble that come our way. So it's important then that we grasp that when Solomon had talked in chapter 6 about these times of calamity, so I've mentioned that in previous messages, Solomon had said, when the people sin, there will be plagues. There will be times of pestilence. There will be times of famine, great trouble in the land. How does the Old Testament describe that? This very word then that the Lord says to Solomon, turn from your wicked ways, really what the Lord is saying, when those wicked times come, when those times of calamity come, they are God's voice to you. Turn from your wickedness. Turn from those things that are displeasing to the Lord. The Lord's discipline is to show us that the Lord is displeased. The scripture does teach this law of the heart. You will reap what you sow. Galatians 6 verse 7. Be not deceived. 
God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so when the farmer sows wheat, he expects to harvest wheat. When he sows corn, he expects to harvest corn. Whatever a man sows, is going to reap. Remember how that was so poignantly, painfully illustrated in the life of Jacob. Remember how he deceived his father, he sowed that seed. What was his reaping? Deceived by his father in law. Remember how he wore Esau's clothes to deceive. His father, presumably Leah, was wearing the clothing that he expected Rachel would be wearing so that he was deceived. Jacob went in before his father, the whole issue before him there was the issue of the firstborn. Isaac wanted the blessing. To go to the firstborn. What was the new thing? He married the firstborn. The blessing that came upon Jacob was irreversible. Again, marriage to Leah was irreversible. He reaped. What he has sown. I say all of this just to remind us then that when the Lord sends adversity our way, it's to cause us to see our sin. Now it is true that not every sickness that we experience is the Lord's discipline. It is true that not every trouble that comes into our life is the direct consequence of our sin. And yet I think there's a danger that we can take that truth and we carry it to such a degree that we never consider searching our hearts when adversity does come. And we make this presumption. Yes, there's adversity, but it's nothing to do with my sin. Surely we should be coming before the Lord and saying, Yes, do search me. Show me, O Lord. William Dyer preached at the time of the Great Fire of London. And I think Dyer lamented over London in the same way that we ought to lament over this land and throughout the world at this time. When the Fire of London came, Dyer yearned that there would be a humbling in the heart of the people. And they would ask themselves, what is the sin that the Lord is disciplining the nation for? And so too is the Lord in his providence has sent coronavirus. There ought to have been that deep contrition and question on the hearts of the nation. Why has God sent? Why in the providence of God has this come? So Dyer said, If you remain as profane as before, as carnal as before, as lukewarm as before, as hard-hearted and cruel as before, as proud and vain as before, as worldly as before, I say, to be thus with you, God is not yet done with London, but his other judgments to pour out upon you. Isn't the world tonight deserving of much greater calamity than coronavirus? Is it our nation? Is it our state? Is it our city? 
deserving of a greater crisis than the crisis in the health service at the present time. It deserves worse than this. In all the crisis, there's no hope left. But can't we bring it closer home? And the Lord in his providence has brought adversities to us. We have desired to turn a blind eye to sin. We have wanted to tolerate our sin, excuse our sin. Let us not blame others for our troubles. Because repentance is associated with even discipline. I want to say finally that this repentance is associated with seeing our duty. I've been emphasizing that we're all to take this part of the text on board. I am to turn from my wicked ways. I want to, in the closing moments then, I said before, you are great personal duty. You see, if we fail in this, it will affect ourselves. If we don't turn from our wicked ways, we will deprive ourselves. But it will affect others as well. And so the Lord in this law has taught us to love the Lord. That's the first great commandment, love the Lord. And then the second, love our fellow man. If we grasp that, then we will see our duty to turn from our sin. Our love for God and our love for others is to motivate us to turn from our sin. And I came across these words, very searching words in the past week. It only takes one to destroy a church. It only takes one to destroy a church. Is there any scriptural evidence for a statement like that? You remember that scene in Joshua chapter 7? Jericho had been overcome. And the Lord's people presumed that they could go up against Ai and take it. We've overcome Jericho. Surely Ai, it, it'll be easy. Remember how they were driven back. Why was that? Was it that Ai was more physically capable than they'd imagined? No. The sin in the camp. One man, one family. When the walls of the city of Jericho had fallen, Achan had gone in. He had taken a Babylonish garment. Instead of destroying it, he kept it for himself. He took silver and gold, and instead of surrendering that, he, he took it and hid them. sin of one man was a hindrance to the entire congregation. As we think of that, let's consider then the words of this phrase, this clause that we're looking at tonight. Turn from my wicked ways. I am to turn from that which is displeasing. Because if I don't, it will not only be a hindrance to me, but a hindrance to others. Now, in contrast to Achan, God can bless a people on account of one man, one woman, one young person. Remember Joseph in the house of Potiphar. One young man that turned from sin. One young man that said, I will not sin against the Lord. The Lord blessed the house of Potiphar. And I'm sure when Potiphar and Joseph cast in prison, Potiphar noticed things went rapidly on the decline. The Lord had blessed that household for the sake of one man of God. Therefore, again, we are to see our personal duty here. 
Will there be one man, one woman, one child who will turn from their displeasing ways this evening? And the Lord's blessing will come as a result. Uh, last Lord's Day I mentioned that idea of one man. I sought for a man, one man, among them that would make up the hedge. One man to pray. And surely we can take that and apply it again to this part of the verse. The Lord is looking for one who will turn from his or her displeasing ways. Perhaps there's some sin in your life the Lord has been putting his finger on. Dear believer, don't excuse it. Dear believer, don't make little of it. Don't say it's not as bad as the sin of my spouse or the sin of my neighbor. It's displeasing in the Lord's sight. Let us turn from our wicked way. Let us instead walk in that way that we sang about at the beginning of the meeting. The way of the psalmist in the first psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Whose way was more holy than our Saviour? Who was more like that tree planted by the river than our Saviour? May our prayer then be tonight, let me be Christ-like. Let me bring all my sin afresh to the cross. Let me turn from my wicked way and walk in that way that is pleasing unto the Lord. May the Lord take his word this evening and write it upon all of our hearts. I'm going to ask our brother Bevis to come and to lead us in our closing hymn. And the words uh, are the great yearning of the Christian uh, for that state of perfection. As I've said earlier in the meeting, we understand that we will not this side of glory be perfect. And yet our desire ought to be, Lord, wash me, make me to be whiter than the snow. Thank you, Bevis.